welcome. <laughs> this has been uh, a topic that went from being relevant sustainability to essential over this last uh, few weeks and months. And life is different for all of us right now. But when we started this conversation back in, in January, Dorothy and I were talking about it as it relates to um, the closing down of, of Maker Faire of a lot of their operations and letting go of their, their staff. And so we were looking at it from more from the perspective of uh, of the financial realities and, and how we uh, approach this next uh, section of time. And, and our roots are in environmental sustainability and, uh, and we had just completed some mergers. I'm gonna start screen sharing uh, with you so you can follow along on some of the stuff that I'm gonna uh, share with you. But, this is really a challenging time. It's not news to anybody, I'm sure. But we had just completed, when, when uh, Dorothy and I spoke, we had just completed a uh, merger with, um, with four uh, other nonprofits. It started with uh, the T for T stands for Trash for Teaching, which will tell you a little bit about where our uh, bottom up comes from. We, Trash for Teaching collects manufacturers clean waste, and we use it in, uh, project-based learning mostly with, with kids, but artists, museums, lots of people come use it. What you're looking at there is the warehouse in Gardena where we store all this material. And back in about um, 2014, I was uh, at an event with our glue guns and material at a table and next to me were these two young men with robots and exciting stuff. And they were two young guys who started Steam Carnival. They are. Uh, Brent Bushnell and Eric Gradman from Two Bit Circus. And uh, they invited us to come to the Steam Carnival and it was amazing. It was an experience, it was full of things that kids had made, things that people were putting together for kids to make, and then a whole host of experiences that Two Bit Circus had put together that were interactive. And I went to uh, Brent and Eric after that event and, and asked them to join our board. I felt like I had just experienced the new version of Cirque du Soleil, only instead of sitting back and watching the spectacle, you were immersed in it and part of it. And it really, uh, the 30,000 some kids that walked through that weekend, their lives were changed because it made science, technology, engineering, and math real, and it made art as important as the other elements. So uh, we, merged in uh, 2017. Brent did join our board and was on the board for a couple of years before he said they were really thinking about starting their own nonprofit. And Trash was a Trash for Teaching was a great organization with a really problematic name, as you can imagine. It was hard to raise funds with. It took explanation every time I, I said the name and and well, just all kinds of complications. But we had a great list of projects and a good reputation. And we were already vendors in the schools that's, that uh, Tubit would wanna work in. So I went back to them and suggested that we combine forces and change our name to the Tubit Circus Foundation, which is what we did. And then the following year, uh, LA Makerspace, which I'm, the name tells it all. Uh, and many of you probably already know the amazing Maya Stark who came to us through the uh, um, merger and I'm thrilled with that. Uh, she'll be at the conference all uh, through this week with, with most of us. And, and then following that was imagination.org and they were having a problem. They needed a new um, executive director. I have no interest in leaving what I'm doing, but I love what they were doing. And, and um, they grew out of the non or the video that went viral in 2012 for uh, Kane's Arcade. It was about a nine-year-old boy who made an arcade in, out of cardboard in his dad's um, machine shop. Well, not machine shop, uh, sort of automotive aftermarket parts place and, and uh, really kind of junkyard in the back. Uh, and Kane went to work with his dad every uh, week in, in the summer and he created this very elaborate arcade. And I'm going to tell you a little more about that in a few minutes. But why we do all of what we do is in part as a result of this. And the whole issue of sustainability now is not just about finances. It's, uh, for us, it's, it's multi-leveled. It's about, uh, well, I'm going too fast, sorry. It's about finances. It's about 
how we are in the world and who we are and and what we can do to make this uh, work for future generations. Because if this is true, if 65% of these kids are gonna have jobs that don't exist, we need to be raising people who are problem solvers and critical thinkers. And I'm gonna get into how we, how we do that a little bit more. And this is really more about uh, who I am and who we all are right now, but I have been a fish out of water since I was a kid. We, I grew up on a farm in Canada. Uh, we were in the middle of the middle of nowhere. Um, if you did a, a triangle from Windsor, London and Sarnia, we were in the middle of that. So it was an hour drive for us to get to any city. And we went once a year to the city to do Christmas shopping. I always felt like a fish out of water and I wanted to understand how people in the city lived. So I tried really hard to fit in. And with this pandemic, we are all fish out of water now. We are all looking for how to be in this new reality. Uh, no one has the answer. No one has been exactly here before. We've had other challenges, but this is the first time in recorded history where the whole world is dealing with a pandemic at the same time. We're all in this together. And now uh, for those of us in the US, there's also the added uh, stress of, of what's going on around the protests. And my heart goes out to anyone who's lost family members in either of those realities or who has been dealing with the, uh, the fallout of it. It's heartbreaking and, uh, and I think, you know, I definitely am on the side of, of change. And, and we have an opportunity now to figure out who we are when we come out of this, who we are as a community, as culture, as a country, as educators and as makers. And I think the maker community is, is really in a position to manage this better than most communities. Because when there's a problem, the maker community looks at the problem, studies the problem, decides who needs to be in the room to address the problem, and then we make things. So we look at sustainability through the lens of these three uh, issues. And you know, the environmental side is probably uh, dictate from when I was uh, that kid growing up on a, on a farm. Like there are things that you consider. I was uh, about seven or eight years old when I first heard a report. We, we listened to the farm market report at dinner table every night. That was all we listened to when it was over the radio went off. But I heard someone talking about a future time when the land would be depleted and crops wouldn't grow and landfills would be overflowing and and all of those things had quite an impact on my young mind because being raised on a farm, nobody leaves to go to work. The farm is where you all live and you all work. And, and so I knew at a very young age that that was in jeopardy. And, uh, and I was worried about what we would do to fix it. Then the next one, of course, is the one that we all think of is the financial uh, sustainability and, and how we, uh, find a way to keep the bills paid when things change like they just have. And then uh, cultural, I think it's really worth repeating that this world, the maker world, is a culture that is worth saving. We have uh, people, the, the Culver City uh, crash space produced 12,000 personal protective uh, equipment uh, offerings for uh, and donated them during this pandemic. And I think that's echoed around the country. We are a, a community of, of with a significant brain trust. And I think a community that relies on science. And, and this is a time when we need those voices uh, more than ever. So let's start with the environmental side of this. Our um, uh, emphasis is on for the most part, building these STEAM labs and teaching teachers how to work in a project-based uh, environment with trying to get rid of textbooks, trying to get rid of lectures, trying to have teachers become more of a facilitator in the classroom, more of someone who offers a, uh, a prompt or a challenge rather than teaching a lesson. So as soon as the pandemic started, we started doing a 10 a.m. Uh, project stream. It's on Twitch, YouTube, and, and uh, Facebook. And the idea was there are just so many parents who are suddenly homeschooling and they're desperate for help and, and backup. And we just uh, decided to start doing it. So we've been now, I guess, three months. We started the first Wednesday 
of the lockdown in Los Angeles, which was the week of the 15th of March. And none of our folks knew how to do any of it. So everybody was, well, we need to study this, we need to get training. And uh, Brent Bushnell, who's the chairman of our board, I'm gonna talk about him again in a minute, but his mantra is, if you wait until you're ready, it's too late. And so we all jumped in and the first few streams were kind of awkward. Like I had to call and say, you know, you can't have your back to the camera while you're explaining these things. Little things about learning how to be uh, on camera that were just uh, part of the challenge. But we do, uh, we do this, and I'm also gonna talk a little more about what we did to adjust quickly, but these STEAM labs are filled with random upcycled materials. So we don't give instructions on anything we do, uh, except with teachers, because that became clear right away that they really need it. But when we give the instructions to the teachers, we beg them not to use those instructions with their students, that they should give the challenge and let the students struggle. And you know, we, you can buy kids an expensive robotics kit and they will learn to make the robot that that kit designer designed, but they learn to become follow the order or follow the instruction folks. And those are the jobs that robots are gonna take over in the future. So what we encourage people to do is show up with a prompt, show up with like, okay, we're gonna make a robot. And here's a bunch of random materials, some old motors and maybe some Raspberry Pi or Arduinos how do you think we could make a robot and let the kids get into it and even when you see them doing something that you know is going to fail don't interfere the learning comes from the experience of getting there and and failing and learning from that failure and also in the bigger picture of things learning that failure is not always the end of something failure is an opportunity to learn something new before you go to the next iteration. And it's not always about money either. I love this story, this young man, and you can find, if you uh, go to YouTube and, and put his name in, you'll find a video about this young man, but he is from Africa. He uh, built a radio station for his village out of material he scrounged from the uh, landfill site. He uh, then he felt, felt that since his village only gets electricity a couple of times a week, he learned how to make batteries and he built batteries and gave them to his friends and neighbors so that they could have electricity more often. And this kid had no money he, and he didn't really have anybody telling him to go do. He had a need and a desire and a belief that he could answer that uh, need. And that comes from failing and trying and failing and trying. And, and that doesn't come from parents with deep pockets making sure that the kids have the best of everything and the newest of everything. That's not what's best for kids. It's letting them struggle with things, letting them find their way through something that, that builds that muscle. And I, I mentioned um, Two-Bit Circus or the Kane's Arcade earlier as part of Two-Bit Circus now. Kane, you know, nine-year-old boy, uh, it hit, what his parents gave him was space, and that was it. Nobody asked him to make these things, no, but nobody got in his way either. They gave him the space at the front of dad's shop, and they let him put this together. There's another lesson, I'm going to talk about uh, Nervon, the, the documentarian who did this little video, because there's a lesson in it from uh, him as well, in that that kid had done that all over the summer and it had been there and he'd been trying to get people to play his games all summer. No one did. Everyone who came was in a rush, they in and out, nobody talked to him about it. Nobody. Nirvan went looking for a handle for his broke down Toyota Corolla. He sees this kid and he asks the kid if he can play and that's where this all started. I'll, I'll talk about it again uh, in a little bit. But I mean, my staff asked me when they saw this slide, are you sure that's supposed to have a question mark there? And it is a question mark for me because these kids are considered exceptional. They're all teen inventors. They all, and again, if you, if you uh, go to YouTube and look for this, you'll, you'll find stories on all of them. But my question is really, is it that they're exceptional kids or is it just that somebody sparked something in them? And sometimes it's just one thing you say to a kid at the right time that sets them off into a, wow, maybe I could, and lets them go down the rabbit hole. And, and by the same token, it's sometimes something that we say uh, negatively to a kid that can change the course of what they're doing as well. So 
this is our mission and this is why when i say we we really take all of this stuff seriously we take the whole circus idea seriously but this is what gets us going every morning and why we do what we do and i you know went to a, a presentation a couple of years ago at google where they said you should never read what's on the uh, slides so i'm i'm when i put these up going to let you uh, go through them, but it's really just to to tell you a little bit about who we are and why we do what we do. So the financial viability from us, these are the questions that that we go through. Like first of all, if you're a nonprofit, then who on the board can help? And sometimes there's people who can write checks, but there are also people with great ideas. And and in my case, I have like this is just three of a an absolutely amazing board that I have and so Brent Bushnell oh sorry Brent Bushnell is the uh, founder co-founder of Two Bit Circus and our board chair uh, Nirvan is the uh, documentarian that did Kane's Arcade and and he started the Global Cardboard Challenge and Malik Ducard who came to us through the LA Makerspace uh, merger. Uh, with YouTube, I mean, when these three guys go out and speak at an event, I would just like to be there with a broom and a dustpan and pick up all of the business cards of people who want to do business with them. And we are their philanthropic uh, organization. So I think my, my best uh, advantage in fundraising is uh, not just these three, because the, uh, we have a, about 14 people now on our board. And I would say a good two thirds of them do a lot of public speaking and a lot of public work. So when you're looking at putting the board together, those are really important factors to, uh, to consider. And the Global Cardboard Challenge is a good example. Like when you're looking at what can be monetized in what you do, some things are not monetized. This is definitely not. The Global Cardboard Challenge is free. People all over the world do it. Over a million kids have, have been involved and, and it's been, a, uh, a, a motivating experience around the world, but it's not a moneymaker. It's, uh, it's something that fulfills our mission and, and offers kids a very low barrier to entry. Most things you have to buy a kit, you have to buy something, and, and we have kits. There's no, uh, we have kits that follow the projects that we do on, uh, in the morning stream. But for the most part, we have uh, a lot of these kinds of events that tell sponsors and potential sponsors who we are and what we're about. So this is deliberately illegible. I mean, I will share this slide and you can get a magnifying glass out and take a look at it. But when, when I was asking Maya for some uh, feedback on, on what I was gonna talk about, she said, I think you really need to talk about some of the stuff that we've done since COVID-19 uh, uh, became a problem. And these are the things that we did. We started on Twitch, which was really a, like gave us a small audience to start with because we were looking for much younger kids than they usually have and parents that are often not there. But we got our, uh, our legs under us and then went live on, on YouTube and, and Facebook at the same time. And, and you know, now we have like over 40 some projects that are uh, videotaped and and as a result of that we had also made our project books that we used to sell online we made those free as soon as the uh, safer at home order started and then we partnered with Annenberg Lerner Annenberg has been a great partner on several projects we've done in the past and they have a website that is uh, described by another one of our staff as the Fort Knox of curriculum and so um, we partnered with them and they've put all of our projects now, I think a couple hundred on their uh, platform. Again, offering it for free and linking it to the video so that parents have a, they have a place to follow through if they want to, but we also encourage them, let the kids try it themselves first and then maybe watch the video after you've done it once. But the adjustment for us to, uh, and this is where the kits came up as well, is that we, we don't know when we'll be able to open our warehouse. We used to let people come and pick up material and shop. And of course, we've had to put in a new protocol for how we receive material to keep everybody safe. But we think now we will become more a fulfillment center than a place where people can come and pick up. And these are our values. Like We, we do have an opportunity to rethink the way we are in the world and who we are, where we show up. 
And just as a, a point of, uh, of reference, um, Maya is the one who chose number two. And, and, and I fought hard to help her keep it there because there was some pushback on that one. Now it's even more important than it was when we first sat down to do this. When we finished the merger, as soon as all four of us were under one big tent, we sat down, all the directors, and we came up with our new mission, vision, and values. So what I'm sharing with you here is a result of the, uh, of the mergers. And now, finally, the cultural sustainability. So that picture of our team, most of the team got into that is the very end of the night of our first uh, anti-gala. And that was last uh, October. We were planning another one for this October. It may, be, uh, it, may, well, it may be happen virtually, but it was a lot of fun. And that is the, the group that, uh, that I go to work with every day and that I just love having uh, a part of. So this is the vision statement that we, uh, that we came up with. And I'll leave it there long enough for you to be able to, to read it. The, the picture you see is at Two Bit Circus Corporate's downtown micro amusement park in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, where in the Arts District in Los Angeles. So that's the, the stilt walker who's there. She was at the, uh, the anti gala. And, um, and we just, we, for a long time, we were taking kids through there on tours to show them all of the types of careers that exist around STEAM and everything from creating games and talking to kids about the fact that now as children, you are consumers of other people's games. But while you're playing those games, you might want to think about what you would create if you were the game creator. And then we show them how everything from the, the uh, coding and, and design of the game to the graphics that go into it and the welders that put the cabinets together that the games are played in. So uh, that'll, that'll be on hold for a little while, I guess, as well. But I wanted to walk you through, this is the team, and I, I think of it as the team you don't want to lose. So um, Dr. Dejana Figueroa, her PhD is in uh, uh, marine biology. And when I first started with Trash for Teaching, we made our very first STEAM lab for Dejana at uh, the Muse School, which is uh, James Cameron's alternative to homeschooling. He started a school and they do it in a, uh, what used to be a summer camp. Uh, way up in in the in the hills above Malibu, it's it's an incredible environment. But we built our first makerspace there, and and for about six years, I was stalking Dejana and wanted to bring her on the team. And as of uh, about a year ago now, she joined us as our director of playful learning. And then Justin, who is my unicorn, Justin came to us to, as a uh, to fill in on a project that we had to deliver in San Francisco. And he way over delivered on the project. It was so amazing. And it just turned out that about two weeks later, we needed somebody on staff. We had a, somebody leave and an opening came up and we called Justin and he has a double undergrad degree in fine arts and science. And, uh, and then he, has a, he was pre-med, he has a, a master's in global medicine. So I'm sure his mother's not thrilled with me that he left pre-med and joined the circus. But he's, uh, and he is responsible for the graphics that you see on this deck as well. Smita Singh came to us through imagination and uh, imagination.org. And I have told the board members from there uh, many times since that had I known before the merger, I would definitely have tried to steal her. She does uh, all of the, she does the, manages the imagination programming, but she also does sponsorship work for all the uh, divisions. And then Maya, who I've been talking about, Maya came to us through LA Makerspace. And the thing about Maya is that everybody wants to work with Maya. So when we need uh, volunteers for something, we do a shout out to Maya. Maya, can you find, and, and sometimes the volunteers are in person and sometimes they're digital. And I'm sure some of you in, uh, in the uh, Nation of Maker community are, uh, are part of the uh, response team for her. But Maya is just another one that, yes, I would have tried to steal her had I only known. Mindy Sanchez, who keeps us all in the straight and narrow and manages our operations, she's, the, uh, she's a nuts and bolts. Uh, she's a beautiful artist. And when people get gifts from Mindy, they don't want to open them. Uh, we gave Brent a, a wedding present uh, a few years ago, and he said it sat on their 
table for a, a couple of months before they opened it because the wrapping was so gorgeous. He said, I really hope it's not a gerbil or something that we, uh, we left there. It requires feeding. And then uh, Whit Wagner, who's our director of communications, um, full disclosure, he's my son-in-law, but I didn't hire him. He was, uh, when I first started with Trash for Teaching, I had asked him to look at our website because we didn't have the ability to search in the website. He uh, was helping me with that when our website crashed and the web uh, folks told me it was gonna cost $10,000 to get it up and running and we were really tiny at that point. We were about $180,000 a year when I started uh, and, and we're this year at about two and a half million. So the growth has been rapid. And the board hired Wit because he called me and said, hey, listen, you don't have to pay that $10,000. I actually copied the website so I could work at it offline and I can get you back up in a couple of hours. So the board hired him and uh, he does all of our communications website and, uh, and it's been a wonderful group to work with. And you know, the nation of makers, I really like hats off to President Obama for recognizing how important the maker community is. And, and to Dorothy for all the work that she's doing to keep this community moving. We are uniquely positioned to help in this situation. And really, we want to have a voice in, in what happens and how this world looks in the future. And, uh, and, and I hope that we can have that voice include some of those values that I shared with you uh, a, a few slides ago. But so just in wrapping up now, the, we ask ourselves a couple of questions before we uh, embrace anything new on, on it to help us stay sustainable. And the first one is, does it honor our mission? And again, sometimes those things bring in revenue and sometimes they don't, like the cardboard challenge. They just are something that we need to do. And then the, uh, the other question is, do, do, we, do we have the staff internally right now to take this on or do we need new staff? And if we need new staff, then it, it's not a number one priority. But before I move off this slide, I just wanna point out all those spaces in that room. I don't know if any of you have ever been to a professional development with teachers, but usually they're trying to nap at the back of the room and they're there because they have to be and they're paid to be. You can see on these faces, they are working with Dr. Dejana Figueroa in this workshop and that laughter is not just on this slide, it is throughout the day. We really, Teachers are our celebrities. We work hard to make sure that they enjoy their time with us and we really work to make sure that they feel supported and, and know what we're uh, offering. So that's it for me. I'm gonna stop sharing my slides and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. But I wanna say going forward that whatever you can do to lower your carbon footprint as a maker, we will, I'm, I'm begging you to consider it and do whatever you can. And uh, let's be positive and make this change. There will be tough things that come out of this, but there will also be wonderful opportunities. So let's make it happen. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, I apologize, uh, I was having technical issues, so I could not uh, be heard, but it sounds like I can be heard now, right? You can hear me? Good. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, frantically waving when you were like, oh, I'm just going to get started. <laughs> so um, but that was amazing. So thank you so much for sharing with us. I really, really enjoyed your talk. I always enjoy the work that you do um, at 2-Bit Circus. Um, and I want to see if anyone has any questions. Let's see. So if you have questions, please put them into the chat and then we'll make sure that Leah has them. And I think I went a little bit long too, so I'm happy to just, like, I'll, be, I'll be around later if anybody has any questions, I'll uh, happy to answer. So there is a question, how did you set up your reuse center? Well, I inherited the reuse center. It was a manufacturing husband and wife team who started taking stuff from their, man they manufactured the heart-shaped boxes for C's candy. So they used to take those to their son's daycare and then they started thinking there must be other people who could use this. So they set up the nonprofit. That's, they, it was the tongue in cheek uh, humor of the founder calling it trash for teaching. And they were manufacturers with stuff to offer to education. 
And when I came in, we, we just changed that to we are educators who use stuff manufacturers have. So we gather from a few hundred manufacturers now. And uh, I think the, the reason that they were able to stay alive for as long as they did on that program was that they owned the building. So if they couldn't pay their rent, they did. And when they hired me, they gave me a six month window to help them monetize what they were doing. And, and in that six months, if we could, couldn't find things to monetize, then we had to shut it down because they were retiring and they didn't want the headache. So it, it, it's not without complication. And we actually wrote a, uh, a playbook on how to do this for others who are interested. Awesome. Uh, I hope that we get to share that resource with folks after. Um, so a couple more questions have come in. Wow, there's a lot of them that are coming in now. So one question is, where does your funding come from? Oh gosh, I'm glad that question came up because I meant to say so. So until this, this uh, winter, we were about 50-50 fee-for-service and grants. And uh, all of the fee-for-service work happens between January and June, so there's none this year. So we will be completely grant dependent for the next foreseeable future. And we were blessed with a million dollar grant that wasn't counted in the two and a half million that, I, that, we, that we've done uh, in revenue over the last year. We, that million dollar grant from Vans Shoes was to launch several new projects, which we hope we will be able to do, but ultimately it was unrestricted and we've talked to Vans since, we talk to them regularly now, but uh, we've been using that as part of how we're staying alive during the no revenue, uh, or at least no fee for service time period. And we are just really pumping up our grant writing uh, program. But we tried to, I went to the staff when this first happened and asked everyone to accept a four day work week and a lower pay so that we could keep everyone on. And that's another reason why I have a team I don't want to lose because everyone said, okay. Uh, awesome. So we have a couple more questions coming in. So one question is, how do you spread the word about your services? So it's, it's really been word of mouth so far. Although when we partnered with Two Bit Circus, we be, we inherited an amazing uh, PR firm out of San Francisco called 104 West, and they have been amazing at getting us a little more attention, both within the education community and at, at large. So. I think it's really money well spent once you can afford it to make sure you have somebody doing public relations for you uh, to just get the message out. Awesome. And questions keep coming. These are all great questions. Um, so one question came in about how do you handle the need to sanitize items and that's in quote sanitize items during the pandemic. Yeah, so we had a meeting about this early on. What we're doing now is as soon as a donation comes in, it sits for seven days before anybody touches it, which means we need more space, clearly. Uh, and also, I think becoming, we're, we're going to move uh, our warehouse offerings online. So we'll barcode everything and people can go online and do their purchasing, which is going to be hard for some people like me who are tactile and want to be in there, but it at least allow us to keep going. Gotcha. Okay, two more questions coming uh, that just came in. They're um, different, but they're relate related to each other by the fact that they're about relationships. Um, so one person asked, um, they said, this is great. We have waste product from our PPE making effort that could easily be repurposed. Cotton rags, scraps, thermoplastic from bags, buckles, et cetera. But we're having challenges finding, ooh, and it just scrolled up, finding educators or recyclers to take them. Are there res resources we can hook into um, to keep this stuff out of the waste stream. So how do you how do you engage with educators? I think is the first question. Yeah, it's not simple really because there are a lot of restrictions on schools and teachers about what they can and can't do. So you need to become a vendor for the schools before they can, unless you just are you know with a teacher or a private school that you can uh, make it available to. And we are trying to put together a, a a list of organizations like us that exist around the country where so we can tell people where you can send it and. Uh, but it doesn't exist yet that I know of. 
Awesome. Thank you. I think a lot of people are interested in that and just sort of understanding because it seems like a big barrier, um, but there's a lot of people that want to help. Um, then the other question about relationships is um, uh, came from an advanced manufacturing center. So the person says, we are an advanced manufacturing center that has recently added a maker aspect. How do you approach manufacturers to establish the relationship? We work with a lot of manufacturers and reuse on-site material but would like to expand the engagement. So this is like the, the, the perennial question of like, how do we make these relationships? Yeah, it's really one at a time. And sometimes it's driving, well, our founder for the Trash for Teaching side, he was dumpster diving. He was like, he would see a manufacturing place and think, I bet they have interesting stuff. And he was, uh, so that, that I don't recommend that because I think it's illegal. But, um, but I do think like if, if you're a nonprofit and you walk in the front door of a place that's a manu manufacturers don't like send sending stuff to landfill and depending on where you live there are a lot of new restrictions los angeles uh mayor garcetti declared uh, the first year in office he declared that he was going to lower the solid waste in los angeles by 90 percent over a 10-year period and the first year and a half they had the first 45 percent out of the way so there are i think it's really like I've tried to work with the Manufacturers Association and, and had not much success. Like I didn't get any negative from them, but nothing really, they, they didn't embrace the idea, let's put it that way, where they're more involved in lobbying and that kind of thing. So it really is when you're driving, because if I'm driving down the street and I see an interesting manufacturing spot now, I will stop in and give them a business card and tell them what we do. And, and it's, it's a way to bridge manufacturing and education for us. People want to do something for education. They don't know how or what, but manufacturers have been pretty receptive. And for them, if you're a nonprofit, it's a no brainer. We had one company call and, and ask us if we could take 40,000 cobalt blue glass jars. I didn't know what that would look like, but I said, sure. Cause I thought, well, we could always let, we ended up lining the parking lot. We ended up building a wall inside the building. And that was about five years ago. And we are down to the last pallet of cobalt blue glass jars. They just, you know, a little bit at a time, but they paid to ship them to us. And they uh, paid us to take them because for them, it was gonna cost them to take that to landfill. They were gonna have to ship it to landfill. And they were just, they were changing their packaging from glass to plastic so that they could save money on their long haul uh, shipping. So I think it's really about looking at the opportunity from their perspective and being able to tell them what helps them. And what helps them is you're gonna lower your carbon footprint, you're gonna have an, a link to education, you're gonna be able to show people things that are made out of your material by kids in schools. 100%. All right, this is, I think we're going to take this as the last question. Um, I will deliver some opening comments, everybody. <laughs> I promise. Um, uh, so, um, Michael Landa asks, I'm curious about how your story and messaging changes with different audiences or over time, especially with combining multiple organizations together. What have you found to work with educators, sponsors, kids, etc.? How has your PR uh, person framed your story in different ways than you have in surprising or useful ways. Thanks. Wow, that is a great question and, and a long one for the last, but um, <laughs> and, and it's true, we do change. So the core of our message is the same for every audience, like try and lower your waste, try and reuse things, try to make it yourself, don't buy new, all those kinds of things are what we, what we um, put out there in the world. Um, with teachers, clearly we're talking to them more about how they approach the classroom because we're, I'm a revolutionary at heart and, and I feel like we've been handed an opportunity for a revolution and education has needed this for a hundred years. So we're talking to the teachers, not just about a new way of teaching, but a new way of being in the classroom, a new way of being with the students and not being the person with all the answers. And, and trying to hold back on the conversations you might have with a student until they're asking the question. And, and you might help prompt the right questions and you don't do it in an adversarial way. Like, so there's just a whole lot. We do a lot of like whole day workshops with teachers. We do a lot of one hour workshops. Uh, and then with sponsors, well, like really it's, 
the sponsor one is an easy one once you know they're in, if they're interested in your community then you know what approach to take and it's a little bit different with everyone it's sort of like this is my first nonprofit venture ever i come from the for-profit world and i my first thought was well so once you've written a grant then you just hand that that grant application to everybody well how crazy was that every grant application is its own 20-day program to get it ready and so uh learning how to how to manage your way through that has been a real challenge uh but it is always looking at it from their perspective instead of what I need from them. I mean, I know what I need from them, but what do they want from me that I can offer so that I get what I need from them? And then for the PR uh, question, they haven't really changed anything about the way we approach things. As a matter of fact, like what they've done is just lifted up what we've been doing and exposed it to new communities because Remember, we were $180,000 a year revenue total when I took over. There was no budget for anything other than trying to keep the lights on. And, and there were only two of us at the time the staff paid. Now we're 17 full-time people and another 11 part-time people. I'm still working to keep the lights on and, and keep everybody paid. Um, but the, the PR company have really told people about us more than they've changed who we are. And they've written our like when i they ask me for an opinion piece on something and i'll write it and send it off to them and and i get it back and i sound so much more brilliant when they say what i'm saying so having professional writers i mean i've done a lot of writing in my life clearly a, a, a dissertation takes a fair amount of writing but i've always had editors helping with that too and i think it's it's important the reason i went through the list of all of our directors is it's important to have people who have different strengths than you and every one of those people, when I, when I told you a little bit about each of them, they all have very different strengths. And the worry when we first merged was, will they get along? Will the different, and I think that's the sort of overarching part of this question, the, I was really concerned about that. But it really, I think having everybody come together and rewrite the mission, vision, and values right away was a, a, a real bonding experience. And we have a team of people now who nobody's finger pointing. When something goes wrong, I don't hear any like, well, he did it or she did it. All I hear is like, I can help with this. I'll take over that part. You got, so everybody jumps in to try and help each other. And again, that is a, a team you don't want to lose. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for your time today, Leah, and for being the person that went first. Uh, I think the person that goes first is the bravest. So thank you for being our bravest keynote we have um, in this brave adventure that we have as virtual NomCon. I really, really appreciate you being here and joining us and everyone today.